I mean, I have no formal role, yeah. but you know, to the degree that this is a proposed public infrastructure project, I take an interest personally and on behalf of my community, because mm -hmm. we are the community that is in the firing zone. We are the community that is at risk of flooding. Uh, our, the history of the Hawkesbury community is deeply bound to our history with the river and it has been significantly shaped by our relationship with the river and its floods. 123, I suppose you could say 124 since January of this year, floods since European settlement in the 1790s. Well, see, it, it, it pays to know the, the prehistory of this. Yeah. My council, Hawkesbury Council, were advocating to the state government to lower the level of water in Warragamba Dam for flood mitigation purposes all the way back to the mid 1970s. Yeah. When the dam opened in 1960, there was um, uh, a, a recognition that it did not serve any flood mitigation purpose. It was for Sydney's water needs. Yeah. It did nothing to reduce the severity of floods and people knew it. In fact, it's true that five of the 10 worst floods that have ever affected our district uh, since 1867 have occurred since Warragamba Dam was built and completed in 1960. And that's because the water for a flood can come from a variety of sources. It doesn't just come from the Warragamba catchment, but it can come from the catchment of one of the 22 different rivers that feed into the, the Hawkesbury Nepean floodplain, which is 22,000 kilometres big. It stretches all the way down to Goulburn and all the way up nearly to Singleton. It only has one outlet in Broken Bay and it has a significant pinch point at the Sackville Gorgeous that causes us to refer to our area as a bathtub. The water fills up the bathtub and it's only got a very, very small plug hole at Sackville Gorge and the water banks up and then takes time to flow down through that pinch point. Mm -hmm. So um, the role that I take on council uh, is, is a recognition of the fact that the, the, the damage, the loss of life, the loss of property, that we are at risk of uh, is most acute in our area. And I think I said to you on the phone before, that one of the things that irks me as an advocate for this project that's in the Hawkesbury area mm. is how many of the people that oppose it have the luxury of doing so from a place of safety. Yeah. Uh, they're either up in the Blue Mountains or, in the, or they're in the Eastern suburbs. Uh, their politics are usually left of centre. I'm not suggesting that they're not properly motivated, but nothing sharpens the mind like the risk to your own life or family or property. Several years ago, I, I attended the, um, the 150th anniversary uh, of the worst flood since European settlement in 1867, and we had a commemorative dinner and the guests of honour at the dinner were the Ether family. There are still Ethers living in the district to this day. I know some of them. But the Ether family lost 12 members of their family in one night in the flood of 1867. They were a farming family. They lived down on the riverbank near a place called Cornwallis, which is between Richmond and Windsor. Uh, the flood rollers rose very quickly. In fact, the flood in 1867 occurred as a result of only four days of rain, but it fell on the wrong part of the catchment and the soils were already soaked and the waters rose so quickly that the family were forced onto the roof and through the night, the roof collapsed and 12 members of the same family, women and children included, perished. And that story is known very widely in the area now as emblematic of the price that can be paid when a bad flood hits. Another story that people know is that the beaches from Long Reef to Barrenjoey were black with uh, 
uprooted trees and dislodged topsoil and the bloated corpses of livestock and probably indeed uh, humans as well um, when that flood occurred. And if we can do anything to mitigate against that risk, we ought to do so. Now in 2017, there was a study that was released called Resilient Valley, Resilient Community. And it laid out a program of works that include flood mitigation to, as they uh, project, minimize the risk of a serious flood by 75%. Now, if you live in the community that's most at risk, that seems like a very sound investment to us. So on, as, as a member of the council, which has traditionally always supported this um, project, um, uh, I was happy to carry the torch. Now, the current Hawkesbury Council is left of centre, and for a variety of environmental reasons, they've been less fulsome in their support of this project citing a variety of reasons. One is that we need to wait on the environmental environmental impact study, that the business case needs to be completed and so on. I, I find those excuses to be fairly thin because there was a well-developed project to raise the dam, not by 14 or 15 metres, which is the current um, plan, but to raise the dam by 23 metres back in the 1990s. Uh, a very comprehensive environmental impact statement was, was issued. It took seven years to compile. The findings of that EIS were ratified by three independent international experts, mm -hmm. and their proposal was to raise Warragamba Dam by 23 metres, a higher rise even than what is being proposed now. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that that plan did not progress was because of the election of a Labor state government in 1996. It was scuttled for that reason. So when people now talk about waiting for the EIS or waiting for there to be more scientific data, my answer is, obviously you don't know your history. We've been here before, we've hashed out this question. We've, we've weighed up the ecological costs to temporary inundation above the dam yeah. and potentially the threat to Aboriginal cultural sites and so forth. But we've weighed that carefully against the potential loss of life and property below the dam. And we've come to the conclusion that we should do this. We've also looked at other plans that people say, oh, well, you know, we should build levees or we should blast the choke points at Sackville Gorge or we should dredge the river or we should build a dam on one of the feeder rivers and i've got to tell you all of these ideas have all been looked at scientifically by hydrological engineers and they all came up with the same conclusion and that is 75 percent of the catchment 75 percent of the potential flood waters come from above warragamba dam in the warragamba part of the catchment so you know there's a long history here and if you're going to write intelligently about this subject you have to know that we've all been here before and it's, it's, it's depressing to find that opponents are so ignorant of their history. Well, yes, there are some significant differences. I mean, the current proposal to raise Warragamba Dam is lower than the proposal in the 1990s, which was to raise the dam by 23 metres. Mm -hmm. And that was regarded as both a good environmental outcome and a good expenditure of public funds, because it's not cheap to raise Warragamba Dam. There's an opportunity cost. Money that is spent on that could be spent on other kinds of public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you take an actuarial approach and you look at the risk to life and property on the floodplain, then the case basically makes itself, in my opinion. So that's the, that's the key difference. What's being proposed here is more modest, uh, less intrusive on the, on the uh, Lake Burragarang catchment than the proposal of the 1990s, which was given a big tick. Yeah. Significantly, the, significantly, the Resilient Valley Resilient Community Report of 2017 yeah. 
doesn't only talk about capital works for flood mitigation. Mm. It also talks about a variety of initiatives to improve public education, yeah. to improve flood evacuation routes, to improve the signage on flood evacuation routes so that people know where to go in the time of a flood. It talks about having better planning controls on the floodplain so that we don't put urban sprawl on lands that are flood prone. Yeah. So it, it's, th there is a constellation of things that we will need to do to, uh, to fix or to mitigate against this problem. Now, unfortunately, that has resulted in some people putting out what is, in my mind is very mischievous misinformation. So, for example, people say that the plan to raise Warragamba Dam Wall is to uh, introduce more development on the floodplain. That is not the case. The uh, Resilient Valley Resilient Community document makes it entirely clear that the building height limit, the one in 100 limit, which sits at 17.5 metres in Windsor and sits at uh, 20 point something metres at Penrith, will stay exactly the same. There will not be any additional development on the floodplain. And in fact, when I put this question directly to state government ministers, they said, this is complete misinformation. It would completely defeat the purpose of having a raised dam for flood mitigation if we then suddenly permitted more urban sprawl on the floodplain that's not on the agenda. Yeah. Um, people would say uh, that it, it, uh, it, it will ruin uh, uh, endangered ecological communities of certain species of eucalyptus or sacred Aboriginal sites around Lake Burragarang. The simple fact of the matter is that Lake Burragarang is, is already created as the result of a flooding event, the creation of Warragamba Dam. Mm -hmm. And that dam level rises and falls naturally, depending on the height of Warragamba Dam itself. If a rainfall event occurs above Lake Burragarang, the water rises gently and it falls gently as those waters make their way over the spillway of Warragamba Dam. What causes real damage in a flood is when waters acquire velocity. And waters acquire velocity downstream from Warragamba Dam when um, they go down through the floodplain and they scour topsoil and they sweep away buildings and livestock and and people's lives and uh you know i i don't know that it's a really a valid comparison uh to, to talk about the temporary inundation above lake Burragarang, which may be some meters higher as a result of a higher dam and the wholesale destruction of uh, communities below the dam i don't feel that people have weighed that uh, as they should Well, I mean, the first point to make is that it is a World Heritage Area. I mean, it has absolutely uh, priceless ecological heritage, not only for um, this area, but for the whole world. And we hold it in, in stewardship, good stewardship, I hope, yeah. uh, or for the world and for future generations. I don't believe that raising Warragamba Dam represents an existential threat to that ecological heritage. Mm -hmm. First thing to observe is that we're talking about very statistically rare events that are inevitable over time, but are not going to happen all the time. And temporary inundations and uh, raising of the water level, um, you know, happens uh, as, as a natural occurrence. So I don't think that the goals of preserving our ecological heritage and mitigating against flood are mutually exclusive. Um, I'm happy to think of myself as a person who cares very much about our environmental heritage, but I think this is one of the red herrings that's put around. Um, the, the Hawkesbury community, or the community that lives and trades on the floodplain, is, a, is an extremely critical voice to be heeded. And uh, environmental groups are entitled to have their say, uh, groups that have uh, the broader view of Australia's management of world heritage sites, they're entitled to have their say. The Colin Foundation 
they're entitled to have their say. I've been to one of their meetings up in Springwood. People spoke very passionately. But um, uh, I understand that uh, Aboriginal groups were attempted to be consulted. A particular instance was quoted to me where um, various Aboriginal stakeholders were invited to a meeting and they didn't bother to turn up, which is disappointing. Um, I don't know what the cause of that was, but nevertheless, that story reached my ears. Um, you, you would assume that if there was a risk to a community, you would ask that community what their view is. And I don't know that the voice of people who are in the bullseye, who are at risk, has been properly weighted when other people who weigh in with their views, which they're entitled to do so, um, are doing so from a place of relative safety. I mean, to my mind, that should carry some weight, but less weight than the people who are at risk. I mean, there was an upper house uh, state inquiry last year where they were looking at this question and they chose to come out to the Hawkesbury and hold a public hearing in Windsor. And I went along on that day and there were several hundred people present. So obviously people are, are interested so long as they know uh, that these consultations are occurring. And it was very significant to me that the public officials that were addressing that hearing were able to refute the misinformation that was going around, the misinformation about this being a stalking horse for more development on the floodplain, completely refuted. The, the idea that raising Warragamba Dam is not the best use of public infrastructure funds to mitigate that risk, that was refuted. And yet people like Bob Brown, the former federal leader of the Greens, Bob Debus, former Labor minister, former um, at both state and federal level, uh, continue to mischievously put out misinformation, including by going to world environmental forums, including one that was held in Azerbaijan a year or two ago, and trashing Australia's reputation as good environmental managers. And I will not put up with that because I think Australia's reputation as an advanced Western country with the resources to put towards environmental protection are something that we should be proud of, not something that we should be talking down in an, in an international forum. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly these have been two very significant events, one more significant than the other. I mean, the fires were literally unprecedented and are uh, uh, historical um, in the sense that these are the worst that we have ever seen and the devastating effect on lives and property in the local economy, I think will be felt for very many years. The mm -hmm. flood, not so much. Although it was the first flood that occurred in 29 years, mm -hmm. the degree of that flood was trivial compared to what uh, we know from history and indeed what I remember from my own lifetime. The last flood was in about 1991, uh, just after I'd left high school. Um, and it was the last flood to cover the North Richmond Bridge and the Windsor Bridge. Statistically speaking, the flood that we had in February was a one in five, somewhere between a one in five and a one in 10 year flood. Uh, so that's a baby in, com in comparison to the floods of, you know, like 1960, which was the worst flood we had had in 60 years or 1867, which was so much higher still. So, I mean, you know, neither of these neither of these events really changed my mind, but it does bring home the fact that we in our comfortable rationalist society with our Western resources and comfortable lives are still very significantly at the prey of mother nature. Mother nature comes through with a fire uh, or even a small flood. And we realize that we still live in the natural world and that everything that we've been careful to build over generations can be swept away in a day, either by water or by fire. It's very timely to be reminded of our mortality, our vulnerability in that sense. As far as flooding is concerned, what we know from this proposal and proposals that have gone before is that building a dam for flood mitigation purposes can mitigate against that risk in this case, by up to 75%. Mm -hmm. 
you look at dams that have been consult, uh, constructed for flood mitigation, like Wyvernhoe Dam up in Brisbane, which has a permanent air gap between its normal water level and its maximum level to act as a buffer to absorb um, the, 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 the interesting unit that's bandied about is the Sidharb, a Sydney harbour's worth of water. <laughs> Wyvernhoe Dam can absorb several Sydney harbours worth of water as a buffer before it tops and then creates flood um, below the dam. Warragamba Dam was built with no such limit in mind. Its 100% level is the 100% storage level of that dam with no buffer intended. And the proposal that some have put forward that we permanently lower the water storage level of Warragamba Dam to provide a degree of flood mitigation, if you'll excuse the pun, doesn't hold water either. Because it in turn would in, uh, put enormous pressure on Sydney's water supply needs. It would cause us to put not one but two new desalination plants online before 2040. These plants can cost $190 million a year to run. They cost an enormous amount of money to run even when they're not being used. One wag termed water out of desalination plants as bottled electricity, and they're not wrong. So when Sydney's water needs are growing, the last thing that we should be doing is lowering Warragamba Dam wall. Oh, and one other point that I'll make since it occurs to me, is that another piece of misinformation is that the dam is being raised to raise Sydney's water storage capacity. But again, public officials that are aware of the proposal refute that and they say, no, the maximum water storage level of Warragamba Dam will be kept exactly where it is. The water storage level will not be raised we will not yield to the temptation of putting more water in there permanently because that negates the flood mitigation. So, uh, you know, people that say that this is all about more water and more water means more development are wrong. They know that these arguments have been refuted and yet they continue to put them out into the public domain. The Hawkesbury area, uh, you, you could charitably describe as a, as a reasonably conservative area. The state seat that overlaps our local government area is a safe liberal seat. Um, what significance that has to this debate, I, 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 I can't say, but I'll just throw that fact out there. Mm -hmm. It's also true that as the council that represents the area under greatest risk of flooding, individual councils in the various terms over the decades have recognised the need and have stood up strongly for capital works, for flood mitigation, certainly for flood awareness. We were very aware in the most recent flood in February that a generation of people had moved into the area or grown up in the area and had no personal experience with floods, which tends to lure people into a false sense of security. Previous mayors like uh, the late Dr. Rex Stubbs was not only in his public role a great champion for flood mitigation works, but was the chair of an organisation then called Dammit, which was a community advocacy group uh, dedicated for uh, to advocate for these changes. And I expected that that support from the council that is in the area that is most at risk would continue in that long and unbroken support for flood mitigation works. The council that was elected in 2016 had a different complexion. Now, I'm not going to portray this as a kind of left-right divide, yes. but I will say that I was disappointed that this council, when I brought a notice of motion uh, a year or two ago to invite it to reiterate the support that had been shown in previous years for this project, mm. declined to do so. Even though the then mayor, who was the member of the chair of our flood risk advisory committee, was the chair of a committee which 
by its own terms of reference, was committed to advocating for flood mitigation works. And yet she couldn't bring herself to vote for that motion when it came before the chamber, which I thought was a profound uh, dissonance and that she should not be the chair of that committee if she cannot see her way clear to be fulsome in her support for flood mitigation works. There is too much at stake for this to be portrayed in a traditional ideological left-right divide. I think we should be thinking in terms of the safety and well-being of the whole of the Hawkesbury community and the community that lives on the floodplain. And thank you for taking an interest in an important issue that has a lot of shades of gray in it. It isn't black and white. Um, I saw people at a meeting of the Kolong Foundation up at Springwood several years ago, speaking really passionately about this. And, you know, Les Sheather and I were at that meeting and we were the only people there representing the community at risk. And I got up and I said as much, and I said, it's very easy to be morally righteous on behalf of the environment or that Aboriginal heritage and all the rest of it, but you're not the people whose houses are going to get flooded mm. if there's a flood like there was in 1867. Yeah. I mean, there's a 15% risk of a flood like that happening in the lifetime of a person who lives to 80. Mm. You know, you know, like, so it, it isn't inevitable, but over time, Things are inevitable. It is going to flood again in the Hawkesbury. What we had in February was just a, a foretaste of that. Mm. And of course, climatologists tell us that we are more likely to see severe weather events as a result of climate change, which means not only more intense fires, but more intense rainfall events and potentially more intense flooding as well. Mm. Our generation, well, put it this way, Future generations will curse our lack of foresight if in a time of plenty and resource and you know, not being in danger is that we didn't do everything that we could to mitigate against the risk that might not come for many years, but we know statistically will eventually come.